Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's New York Music Month session. My name is Shira Gans, and I'm from the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. If you're not familiar with our office, we're the agency that supports all the creative industries in New York City. We do that with lots of different programming. New York Music Month Extended Play is an example of that. So this is a program we've been running since June of 2017. Historically, it was just in June, and this year, due to the pandemic, we turned it into extended play and have been running virtual workshops since January. So if you're interested in today's event, there are lots of other events like it. I, I'll put the uh, URL for the program website into the chat. You can check out all the programming that's happened and see what's coming up. Today, I'm pretty excited about our topic with Dave Kutch on self-management. I think it's something at this point in the pandemic, we could all use a little bit of a brush up on, myself included. So. With that, I will hand it over to Dave and enjoy today's session. Thank you, Shira. So starting off, I feel like I got one of the duller sounding subject titles as far as a presentation for creatives. Yet, I still think it's one of the most important things that you could possibly learn as now, since everybody, even before COVID, uh, has become a studio owner, has become self-managed, has become their own marketing person. Uh, the hardest part is dividing your day up or your time up amongst these various tasks that we all have to do now that we didn't have to do before. Um, I find it most important because uh, 15 years ago, I opened the Mastering Palace and went into business for myself. Prior to then, I had been working at very many of the various mastering studios in New York. I had a staff, I had managers, I didn't have to worry about payroll, I didn't have to worry about paying rent. I didn't have to worry about fixing things. Um, but then when I opened the Mastering Palace, it, everything changed. And I realized I needed to start dividing my days up. And it took me quite a while to, to develop a system that works for me. And there's still times I stray from it. And I have to find myself back to my core that I eventually learned to really divide my day up. And so this way I can spend part of the day being creative and then part of the day dealing with business because the two use two completely different sides of your brain and trying to jump back and forth between these tasks uh, is in the, within minutes is, is torturous and not very productive. Uh, so let's start with the working on your craft part um, and a way to structure your day to make working on your craft peaceful uh, and creative. So it's difficult to, again, have both of those brains operating at the same time. And it's actually exhausting. Uh, and both tasks that you're trying to do at the same time will suffer. Uh, multitasking is genuinely a myth. Nobody is a good multitasker. And there's plenty of um, studies to prove this. Uh, multitasking just ends up you're doing a bunch of things uh, poorly. I was gonna use a different word, but I'll keep it clean, uh, poorly. So the best thing that I have found is dividing my day up. And the first thing to do is in the mornings, I try to do emails and paperwork first. Um, I will do any bill paying, which we'll get to that later. But the main thing is emails. I will start going through my emails or my assistant uh, or studio manager will go through emails and we'll start preparing what needs to be done for the day and also see if there are any revisions we need to do from work that we sent out the night before. Uh, so this way, the bulk of the morning is just sent, is, set, is setting up the rest of the day. And now I'm just dealing with the email part. Semi-creative, semi-not, more communicative with clients. Put a time limit on this. I usually start around 9, 9.30 in the morning looking at these things. I will stop by 11 a.m. noon. So this way I have a hard cutoff. Then at some point around that time, and this is the best part of my day, I shut the phone off, put it into airplane mode. And so then this way I am strictly being creative. I'm strictly mastering songs. I am not dealing with emails. I'm not dealing with Twitter. I'm not dealing with Instagram. I'm not dealing with the phone popping off left and right with uh, people texting me. It's a perpetual distraction from when you're trying to focus and create, whether it be writing a song, creating a beat, producing a song, mixing a song, or mastering a song. If that thing is constantly going off, uh, you are constantly being distracted from being creative. Uh, and that's what we want to do peacefully. 
Uh, there's a reason why they're the days of old or even still now, a lot of people, a lot of creatives work way into the night. Why? Because there's nothing distracting them in the middle of the night. So it is possible to get these things done more peacefully, shut the phone off. Best thing you could do. The other best way to get started, you know, before after you've done your emails and before you're starting to get to work on your creative is I take something from the kitchen, um, a term from the kitchen called mise en place, where you are setting up and pre-chopping all of your ingredients for a recipe or for any dishes, you, dishes you're going to be making all in advance. So now when you start making this dish and start piecing it together, everything is right there in front of you and you just grab it and put it into the recipe. Uh, my assistant and I have worked out a system where we do just that. So while I'm doing emails and he's checking up on him emails, he's also downloading all of the files from clients that morning that we have to do that day. And then he starts setting up all of my sessions. So when I'm done with emails and I'm done with that part, I sit down at my computer, I've shut off the phone, and now all I'm looking at are all of the songs that I'm going to be working on for the day. That is it. So now I have at minimum the next three to four hours to be completely left alone and work on these songs. And my staff also tends to leave me alone during this time. There would be, again, as a studio manager, you step out of the room, you walk down to the other studio and you get three questions asked you and the walk down to the other room. Now I get distracted with three other things that I'm doing. And then I do something in the other room and I come back and I get two more questions. And now I'm completely distracted. I'm doing other things. So usually I try to lock myself in my room and strictly work on that stuff, working on my, you know, my day's worth of mastering at that time. Again, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions uh, while I pontificate about this subject. Um, if I did not learn or figure out how to do these things within the first two, three years of opening the Mastering Palace, I never could have grown it. Uh, I would have been too distracted, too uh, poorly, would poorly productive and would have had many struggles uh, to grow. So in addition to taking care of emails in the morning, the other thing I have found myself doing is only doing bills one day a week. Going through, the e going through mail, it's just, I let it stack up until Friday. And I try to keep Fridays in the morning or in the afternoon for strictly doing bill paying and all of that nonsense. If I am sitting there working, if I am sitting there mastering a song and I figure I'm gonna try and multitask and open some mail at the same time. And then I open up a love letter from the IRS saying I owe them $15,000. That just completely killed my creativity. And now I'm more focused on that nonsense. So I try to let my mail stack up for the entire week. And I try to dedicate a time uh, on Fridays or Thursdays, you know, depends if I want to ruin my weekend or not with the love letter from the IRS. So, so maybe I'll just do it on Thursdays. So already now I've got that aside. I'm not worrying about it. My assistant's got my session set up. And this could be the same thing if you're a mixing engineer or producer. Uh, have everything ready to go before you start creating. Download all of the sessions from your clients. Make sure all of the files, all the tracks are actually there. Uh, I know dozens of times, thousands of times uh, where you get sent a song and it's the vocals are missing or this kick is missing. Uh, make sure your, your client sends you their rough demo and have your assistant or yourself check and see that all of the elements that are in the stereo mix that they sent you are in actually the session. Uh, Cause then you can get started working and you send it to them and they go, hey, this is missing. And you're like, well, you didn't send it to me. So again, this is part of that mise en place where everything in its place, everything ready to go. So you can pretty much work unencumbered and be completely creative. Uh, Brittany has a question. Does bill paying include invoicing clients? It does. Uh, try and because depending upon what type of work you are doing, you could be creating lots and lots of invoices or just one or two. Best thing is at the end of the week, once a week, try and find a time to strictly just do that, uh, doing your invoicing. 
uh, that is a problem that I have totally struggled with. And actually, it was one of the reasons why I realized that I needed to start dividing up my day. Because when I first opened the Mastering Palace, I had to do everything at once. There was so much going on. It was a new world for me. And one of the things that I was terrible at, and I was sometimes I'm still bad at it, I just want to go in there and work on music. And I don't want to fill out my work orders. I just want to stay in that one brain. I want to stay in that one side of my brain. I want to stay creative. I don't want to sit there and start filling out the forms, filling, adding everything up. Um, but I also realized this is how I get paid. This is how I need to be able to pay the bills. This is how I want to be able to keep, this is what I need to do to keep doing this for a living. And I started, instead of having a stack of work orders that I would have to fill out, and I would be, three weeks would go by before I filled out my work orders. And next thing you know, I have to dedicate two or three hours to go back and fill out all my work orders. Terrible, it was terrible. Uh, just because I'm doing this presentation does not mean I'm perfect at all these things. Um, but it's, these are things that I've worked on. I wanna share the things that have worked for me. In addition to that, um, I would now would force myself to do it once a week, fill out all my work orders. And now I've tightened it up a little bit every two days. And every two days makes not only my life easier, but it also makes my studio manager's life much easier. So he can get the bills out faster and we can get paid faster. So anything paperwork related, invoicing, bill paying, bill collections, which is also not creative and nothing but free frustrating, uh, try and save that for one hour a week. Put aside one hour a week to do those things. Um, and, and depending upon your scale and your volume of work, you can make it two hours. Another way for you to time manage or, and this is again, stuff I've done for myself and for some of the mastering engineers that work for me. Uh, there, was a, there was a phrase that an engineer said once, because if you haven't figured out the sound in 15 minutes, either you had the sound 10 minutes ago or you don't know what you're doing. And right now with Splice and so many uh, sounds available, do not spend a half an hour looking for a kick drum while you're making a new beat or a song. Uh, do not spend another half an hour on a snare drum. Find, the, find a good snare or find a good kick. Find the one that puts a smile on your face and then leave it and then continue and then move on to the next one. Uh, as that song develops, as you are working, as you are creating it, you're going to hear what that song or what type of kick or snare drum or hi-hat, whatever the instrument may be, what type of sound that song, now that it's been developing, what it really wants to be. And then you can go and have a focused vision of what you're looking for. Uh, then it's time to make that change. But again, give yourself no more than five to 10 minutes on clicking through snares, through kick drums and snares. Doom, doom, ding, doom, doom. It's exhausting and it's also not creative. It's not, you're not writing the song then. You're just listening and they all start to sound the same after about 10 minutes, uh, at least to me anyway. Um, so great. Also, after you shut your phone off around three, four or five o'clock, whenever, you know, whatever window has worked for you, check your emails, check and see if there's new work coming in, check and see if there's any uh, requests of changes for anything you may have done the day before. So this way now you can use that last two, three, four hours of your day to do those requests. But again, limit the email to about a half an hour for catching up and, and then do the work. The other thing that you can do is put a note in your, in your email signature that says, from these hours every day, my phone will be off and I will not be responding to emails. So this way your clients know that you're not ignoring them, you're not ducking them, that you're really just working on either their stuff or other client stuff with sole focus and attention. Uh, and yeah, that's a great thing. So then people actually will start to bother you less during that time. I have friends, mixing engineers that do the same thing and I avoid calling them during that window because uh, I know I'm probably just gonna get their email or a voicemail anyway. I don't even bother texting them. I wait until I know that their window is up. Um, ah, for Mike, yes, when did you know it was time to hire an assistant? There comes a point when you're a business owner or you know, a, a mixing engineer or producer where you realize you could be more productive or you realize where you're wasting time doing repetitive things where an assistant would be needed, 
where somebody that can set things up for you. It also becomes a financial thing. Um, depending upon where you live, depending upon where you are, you can get an intern and start with a really good intern or do a series of interns until you find one that's really good. There is that balance of when you are now regularly making enough money to worth to be worth having uh, the cost of an assistant. Uh, so you have to balance how much they will cost and how much more productive will you be? How much more will you make? It does become not just a luxury. It becomes one of those things that you have to, you have to uh, account for. Uh, again, the other part, using that business side of the brain rather than the creative side of the brain. And you just really have to, you'll know that time. You know when you can't keep up with client's requests. You know what, that's, that's actually, that's probably the default line. When you can't keep up and can't respond to your clients in a timely fashion, that's when you need an assistant. That's the best way to go. Um, what are some of the reasons to open a formal business and build a brand such as the Mastering Palette instead of growing your own name alone? Uh, is there a point in your career where you found one to have better prospects than the other? That's an excellent question. I specifically opened when I, Open the Mastering Palace, I had decided to not call it Dave Kutch Mastering many years ago. Um, part of which was because I had read a lot of, when I knew I was going to build the Mastering Palace, I decided, I started reading books from CEOs. Actually, when I got into mastering and I started developing a client list, I started reading books outside of the music industry world. I started reading books um, from CEOs of just bigger businesses that I like, and I definitely suggest uh, you all do the same. And you learn some of their ethoses. And one of them was never open a business for the most part under your own name for two reasons. One, and especially in the mastering world, if you want other engineers to come, I, wanted, I always wanted to expand the mastering palace. I always wanted it to be more than just about me. And now for many years, I've had an incredible team of engineers uh, that work out of the mastering palace and i'm so glad to have them there and i would not have been so easily able to bring them on board if they were working for a place called dave kutch mastering because then it's always about me and it's not about them but if you start developing a brand and i took the cachet i was for many years i focused on taking the cachet off of me and putting it on the mastering palace making sure that when other when i when no matter what client called or whenever a record company called the mastering palace that they would know that they would get impeccable, timely, efficient, organized service from us. And that I made sure I brought in engineers that did the same thing. I always want to make sure our reputation was that we'll always take care of whatever your needs are in a timely fashion. We will not tell you uh, we're going to do something at a certain time and not do it. Uh, so I didn't bring in engineers that I thought would not be timely. And the other reason why I chose to call it the Mastering Palace and not Dave Kutch Mastering was, again, from reading books from CEOs, a day will come where I will sell the Mastering Palace. A day will come where I want to retire. And if I sold it to another company and they stopped giving that type of service, I would much rather it be the Mastering Palace giving this poor service under this new company that owns it rather than my name, David Kutch, on there. Uh, so that was one of the key reasons. And this is this is something that's happened often in the past with, with big businesses, where it's a private name that gets turned into a terrible name because a corporation or a private equity firm took it over and ran it completely differently. So now that we've done our work, and we've done our mastering, mixing, producing, songwriting for the day, spend a little time on expanding your craft, on trying new tricks. Again, this is something that you really kind of have to set time of time aside for. And I know I have, you know, if you spend a day working, you're tired, your ears are exhausted. You've taken plenty of ear breaks, but you're still, you're beat. And the lesson you want to do is, is start playing with new toys. Um, so dedicate the time, dedicate one or two hours per week. It doesn't have to be per day, but per week where you download new plugins, you play with new hardware. And my whole my whole new fun is use products the way they were not intended to be used. Um, use, try plugins or products or hardware that was not designed for mastering. Um, it's always in this gray area 
of creativity where you find a new sound, where you find something, you know, use, we've all watched or took classes or watched YouTube videos on how to mic a drum set. You know, you can learn all the proper ways to mic a drum set, you know, the three to one ratio, use this microphone for the kick, this one for the snare or this one for the snare. So you're gonna be making the same sounding drums as everybody else that watched the videos. And there's some basic physics in that that you should follow, but also sometimes not so much. And dive into that gray area of the things you're not supposed to do, the things that aren't perfect. And that's where you're gonna find some great sounds. Um, but if you don't dedicate time in your day to doing these things, it, it's not gonna happen. You gotta really focus on it right now. I'm not gonna be mastering. I'm not gonna be doing emails. I'm not gonna be paying bills. I'm gonna focus on doing things wrong. I'm gonna focus on trying to find a new sound, a new procedure. Uh, let me, I wanna find something that nobody else is doing. And the only way you do that is by coming up with absolutely crazy ideas. And granted, 10 out of 12 ideas that I try are fails. Sounds tar terrible. But then one or two always pops up and ends up being something that I find myself using uh, coming up in a song in the future. Um, yeah, so try not to lie to yourself too. It's it's great lying to yourself saying, oh my God, this is a great new sound. And then three, four days later, you realize, ah, maybe it's not so great. Um, but you will find those things if you if you keep searching in the gray area. And there's two examples I, I, I use. The Eddie Van Halen sound is also uh, one of those wonderful things of experimentation where, you know, they dropped the voltage that feeds a tube amp, you know, you always think this amplifier needs this much voltage. Well, what happens if you starve it of the voltage? You get a whole new sound and that became his signature sound. Find your signature sound in these gray areas of experimentation. It's a lot of fun, but always try and spend some time, uh, focus on spending about an hour a week. An hour a week works out great. Um, and you're not gonna hit, you know, you're not gonna hit gold every, every week, but um, every so often you will and you have found a new tool, a new toy and a new tone. Uh, that makes you different from everybody else. So these these things, being creative, is also part of time management. You know how how you choose to spend that creativity. Uh, also, super important. And this again, this only came to me from years of learning and reading books by people much smarter than myself. So the last part, I've been doing presentations like this for for years. So the last part, I call hustle. And after doing years of presentations, I realized that a lot of the people I were doing presentations to were, they didn't have a lot of clients and they were learning techniques. They were learning, you know, sound engineering skills, but it's kind of useless if you don't have clients to use them on or to use them with. So I started saving the last section of my presentations to offer ideas on how to hustle and how to get new clients and maintain relationships with uh, ones that you're, you're existing ones. And COVID's obviously made things a little bit more difficult. Thankfully, our world is reopening again. But the best thing to do is to meet people, is to, if you've been emailing with a client after two or three songs that you've worked on with them, make a point of going to dinner with them, meeting them for a drink. Um, and if you are socially awkward, don't worry about it. We all are. Everybody in the creative industry is socially awkward. And, but the thing is that we have in common is we like making music and we all share that part of that brain. So they're probably just as awkward as you. And as you do it, you will become a little bit less awkward. Uh, it's the best thing you can do for yourself. It's the best thing you can do to grow. I was awkward. Sometimes I'm still awkward. And if you can get past that, you can easily start to develop a nice regular line of communication or relationship with a client that maybe other people are not. Um, and also be, be accepting of their awkwardness because you want, you want them to be accepted of yours as well. Um, be accepting of all of our differences. Um, we, again, we all have the same goal of making great music. Um, 
got a question from Helen. Do you have any advice for those who are very new to music production? What are the best ways to grow and improve? Uh, there are many great online resources. My best advice is trust your ears. Sorry, breaking the conversation we were speaking about before. Usually I do these things in person. It's easier to have somebody just jump up and yell, but now I'm reading a little side chat. So Helen asked, uh, what advice do I have for a new, for somebody very new to music production? What are the best ways to grow and improve uh, and to uh, mistakes to avoid? Trust your ears and just do exactly what we're saying, what we were just saying. Uh, spend, you have to treat it like a job. I know we, we wanted to go into the music industry because we didn't want to have a job, but you know what? If you're successful in the music industry, you have a job. And the best songwriters and the most successful songwriters that I've known, they treat it like a job. They treat it like a Monday through Friday, wake up every morning, do a workout, and then at 10, 11 o'clock, you know, go and meet their songwriter. And no matter what, sit there and work on music. Um, and I can run off a list, a laundry list of very successful songwriters that treat it like a job. They wake up every day, they go to the studio, they write, they do some other things, they try new toys, you know, everything we just discussed uh, in this past, in this past half hour, they do. So do it every day, do it for hours and hours and hours, as much time as you can. It's the best advice I can get. You only get better by doing it more and you only get bad, better by doing it bad. Uh, we all learn from the mistakes in, in any industry. Uh, it doesn't make any difference what it is. And the more hours in, you will just get better. Uh, you can watch so many videos and you can watch so many instructional things, but unless you're physically sitting there doing it, whether it be on Ableton, Logic, Pro Tools, whatever, just keep doing it and just keep trying new things. So that's my best advice to you, Helen. Um, so for Mike, as a mastering engineer, what's the order of who is most important to maintain a relationship to continue getting more mastering work to see in your career? Uh, everybody, there's nobody more important. All, I, my, my clients are equally uh, in numbers, a and people, producers and mixers. Um, and also there's a layer in that called the administration people at record companies. The administration people are truly are the unsung heroes of the recording industry. They deserve way more credit, way more acknowledgement than they get, twice as much at the minimum. They keep everybody's projects on the label in order, organized as best they can. Uh, it, for them, their job is genuinely trying to herd kittens on catnip, thousands of them. And at the same time interfacing with mixing engineers, mastering engineers, mastering studios, et cetera. And so to add to that list is the admin person. The admin per people are also the ones that will provide you with a PO uh, to get paid. And they will help you when you send the invoice in and the corporate part of the, par of the department has not paid you. They will be the ones to fight to get you paid. So the, administ the administration persons at record labels, the a &R people, the producers and the mixers, they are all important and time should be spent equally with all of them. Frank, if you are a songwriter producer who has some cool songs written, but the demo you make is a four out of 10, uh, should you focus solely on making demos or could you start reaching out to collaborators who may want to help you take collaborators Collaborators is a great idea. Um, I've always, either for myself or what I've watched occur in, in recording studios time and time again is, you know, one songwriter has A idea, the other songwriter has B idea. They start working together and they come up with C or D, which is better than A or B by themselves. Uh, so collaboration is key. We, again, even before COVID, I've always found the way we are currently making records uh, a little frustrating. It could be better. Everything is better when everybody's in the same room. Any projects I've done where I was in the room at the same time as the mixing engineer and the artist and we were finishing it all together uh, was always 
very enjoyable. Uh, and the product, the end product worked out even better. You know, now everybody, there, there's a wonderful side being able to, everybody can work on different sides of the earth and work on a song together, uh, which is a magical thing. It really is. But at the same time, I guarantee you, if you were in the room together at the same time, it would be a whole nother experience. Uh, and I think an even more productive one. I think you would come up with stuff you never would have thought of. So definitely go with a collaborator. And yeah, especially somebody. So I'll continue on on Frank's point. Find your tribe. And I found my tribe when I was young, luckily. And what I mean by your tribe, and this is even more relevant today than it was when I started, find your group of creatives that are young, broke, talented, and hungry. And this, all of this comes under hustle. And this is the night times out. This is after you finish working all day and you go out for the night. And I was luckily found myself in this creative hub and we were fighting to grow our careers. And every time somebody was making a video, they wrote a song and they made a video, but they needed mastering, I did the mastering for free for them. Anytime anybody needed a different service within our group, we just did it for them and did it for free. And what was lucky and what was fortunate is that we were all talented and we never stopped. Persistence is key don't get discouraged. And none of us ever stopped. And slowly as it grew, one of us would get a job that had a budget. You know, their new song had a budget because of the song that I did master them for free and another friend of ours mixed for free, they got a budget for the next song. So they paid the mixing engineer, and then they paid me to do the mastering. And this just kept growing. And everybody has gone on to be very successful. I'm so happy uh, for them now. And I'm so happy that I was accepted into this small group uh, when we were very young. And it was essential to the speedy growth of my career, essential. Um, I, look on back, I look back on that all the time. Nowadays, this is even more important for young artists and producers. Uh, you, know, you can follow the, the odd future model you know, they're a group of collectives. You know, they, nowadays you can do full on video production on your own straight to the finish line. Develop your collective of people. Find a web developer, find a video person, find a great social media person and make them part of your collective and work together in all aspects to grow all of your careers. Because now artists have become their own marketing people. Um, you cannot wait for a record company to sit there and make you a star. You have to do it on your own. And social media is not a skill that I have, that a lot of young artists have. They don't want to do it. it again, that's another part of the brain that you have to use. Um, but sadly, it's become a, it's a, a necessary evil. But there are people who love it and there are people who are good at it and they know how to manipulate it. Bring them into your collective. Uh, it's super important. Um, from Michael, how do you suggest approaching new clients, cold calling via social media. The social media thing works and it doesn't work. We receive a lot of cold requests or people trying to send us their demo and we, we, we kind of do not engage. So for some people it works, for some it doesn't. I would say social media would be great for finding your tribe, for trying your collective individuals. You can go on their socials, see that they're a great photographer and just, again, meet in person. You have to meet in person. Um, go and see creative things together. Go to concerts, go to museums, go to art galleries, uh, do these things as a collective. Um, it will A, inspire you all and it will all bring you to the next level. Um, so in answer to Michael's question, social media is good for meeting new people. It's not necessarily good for getting clients. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Best thing to do is go out and meet people in person. It's the best way you can do it. Oh, and do stuff for free. There's no better way than to develop a new relationship than helping somebody out and doing it for free and just with no strings attached. 
So the, the definition that I have for the word hustle um, is doing work, using your talent for anybody, an artist, an individual, a record label for free with no intentions of getting paid or no intentions in the future of getting paid. Just do it. Nobody knows you. Nobody knows who you are. You're a brand new name. You have not given them a reason to start messing with you, to start using you for work. If you do it for free and they like it, now you're giving them a reason to consider messing with you, considering hiring you for the next job. Do stuff for free. Sometimes I still do stuff for free. If it's something that I hear is great, they don't have a lot of budget, but it's awesome and I wanna work on it, I'll do it for them for free. Uh, it's giving them a taste. And then if it works out, you move forward. But doing stuff for free for potential new clients is the best thing you could possibly do. They've got nothing to lose and only something to gain. And you have to have the attitude that, yes, you might lose a little bit of time. You won't lose any immediate money. And you have to know that maybe it won't work out. But for every 10 times you do something for free, guaranteed one or two of them will work out and it will bring you up a notch up a notch. I call it, a, it's, a, it's like starting a snowman. You know, that beginning of rolling a snow on the ground and getting it bigger and bigger is exhausting in the beginning. It's, and it's exhausting for years. You know, this, this, it's a slow process. But then as that snowball becomes bigger, it rolls down the hill uh, much easier. So as we've discussed, dividing these time, you know, dividing your days up in these three sections, as your career grows, and as you get an assistant or, you know, uh, get people working with you, the percentage of that day and how this day is divided up in those thirds changes. You know, sometimes you have to do a little bit less hustling and a little bit more focusing on the craft um, or being creative or paperwork, which is my nemesis. So these things adjust, you know, these are not finite things, but they are those three things are the, are the most important ways to get through your day. Uh, let's see. On our website, uh, we describe service of a five-star hotel. Do you have assistance to help me with this level of service? I do. Um, we do have that service. And you bring up a question that I was gonna get to. So we have a tremendous client list, both of independent artists and major labels. And I'm very thankful for the success that the Mastering Palace has had and I've had over these years and the artists I get to work with, both independent and established. My only frustration is that now because I have it's such a large list, I don't get to spend that much direct communication time with them. Um, that's one of the things that saddens me, uh, frustrates me of, of the level of success that we've been very, very fortunate to have. I don't get to have one-on-one -on -one time with all these great people. Uh, I'm so fortunate to have, great, to have met such and work with such great uh, creators uh, that not only they're great at their art, but they're also awesome people. So we do try to show our appreciation of their loyalty to working with us. Um, and we send out Christmas gifts every year. Also, this is part of hustle. Uh, we send out gifts every year and it's a long list. You know, we usually send out over 500 packages. Uh, just the shipping alone is incredibly expensive. Um, but it didn't start off that way. It started off small. And in the very first year I opened the Mastering Palace, I ordered tons of little plastic containers and I sat there for a week making a special nut mixture that was like holiday flavored and put a bow on it, wrapped it up, and sent it out and you know granted it wasn't 500 but it was about 100 at that time and it was exhausting and we did it and my clients loved it. it again it's just a small token of appreciation for working with them them hiring us and them also being loyal so gift giving is great it's just uh we also have done usb charges with our branding on it my best advice for gift giving uh, especially if you're doing a mass amount is make sure they, I have a personal thing. I hate dust collectors. 
I hate giving something that's just going to sit on a desk. I like giving something that is useful that they're going to use often. Uh, one year we did scarves. Scarves was uh, one of the things that our clients enjoyed the most. And we, in addition to um, it being useful, we also made sure we had a variety of colors that covered uh, men, women, in between, uh, colors that can go in any direction. So this way, everybody, and we tried to match it up. We also tried to make sure if we were sending to one record company's office, we tried to make sure we didn't give uh, two people the same color. So we had about 20, we had at least 20 different colors um, that we were sending out. So it, it, again, it takes time and effort to do these things right. Uh, and that's, again, that's the five-star hotel service. Uh, it takes time, but it pays off. Um, and it's, uh, and again, we do it because we enjoy it. We, uh, we, do, you know, we are very fortunate to work. You know, we all pinch ourselves. Anybody that's working in the music industry and has made a career in the music industry, doesn't make any difference to what level. If you are paying your bills in the music industry, you are very thankful because when we first all started out, nobody ever thought we'd be able to do this, especially our parents. Um, and then you find yourself where you are paying your bills with it. And you're just very thankful that it's, it's, it's here. You got in and it continues. So we, we send those gifts out with smiles on our faces all the time. Uh, for Michael, since it can be difficult to approach labels to get into their mastering engineering Rolodex, how would you try to develop a relationship at labels? Again, it's doing those songs for free. It's doing those songs and you never know. You could do 50 songs for free for somebody. And this isn't even at the label. This is just an independent. And you need one of those songs to become a hit. And when I was young, I mastered, you know, I had relationships at the major record labels. I knew the people, but they weren't hiring me. Um, I was still assisting somebody. And then one day I had an opportunity to master Sangonia from Outcast, And that album was a hit. Um, immediately you know the two huge singles and then the album was a hit as well and that gave me my calling card at the major record labels so and i was shameless about it when i was again out at places meeting people being introduced to people from friends from my tribe from that my little collective um if they were if they asked me oh what have you worked on stank on you i would introduce myself as hi i'm dave kutch i mastered stank on you uh, like I was shameless about trying to, it's the worst thing to do as an adult, but when you're young and that's the only thing that you have as a calling card, I was shameless about it. Um, and I, when I look back, I wouldn't change it. It worked. And, and still, it was just the beginning of the very, very, very small snowball. It still took years to develop a regular rapport uh, with, with the um, major record companies. Once you get in that door, you always have to take care of them. You have to take care of their deadlines. You have to just make the job of finishing an album, whether you're the mixing engineer, the mastering engineer, or even the producer, make it easy for the people at the record company. Make sure it gets to the end as smoothly as possible. And they will, they will gladly hire you in the future because you got, you got the project over the finish line. They're exhausted. They, it's, it's like playing football. They have been pushing that ball down the field, down the field for a year. And they get to the very end and they need the mixing engineer and the mastering engineer to just get this thing over the goal line. And that's just make it easy for them. Uh, and it's not easy, you know, it's hard work, um, but that will develop your positive reputation and will put you at the top of the list to get the phone call next time they need somebody and they get to decide who they use. They're always gonna call the person that was easy to work with as opposed to the person that was difficult to work with. And that, again, that is with any industry and at any position that you are in, um, in this creative chain. So definitely. Uh, so from Roberto, what is your target? <laughs> Luffs. Um, that's a question that I'm not going to answer today because it's a, one, it's a, one, it's a more creative thing. It's a different side of this conversation, but I will say this. I could care less about those numbers. Um, what sounds good? 
because there's a point where things at certain levels will sound great and other ones they won't. So I'm going to leave it at that. And let me see, was there anything else? Any other questions before I go on to, oh, read. Read, read, read. Uh, this is part of hustling. Read. Read books from people in the music industry. Read more books from people outside of the music industry. Read books from CEOs of companies that you like, from products that you like. You will get a different perspective on everything. And that's there's no more important advice that I can give read things outside of our world it's the only way you will grow i could not have opened the mastering palace i could not have i'm sorry i could not have expanded the mastering palace had i not read dale carnegie's how to win friends and influence others write it down grab a pen i'll say it again read dale carnegie's how to win friends and influence others at the core of that book, the lesson is put your ego aside, whether you are right or wrong in a debate process or whatever the case be with the client, put, it, put your ego aside and focus on the end goal. And the end goal is either to maintain that client, the end goal is to either make sure the song is done correctly find ways around that obstacle that put your ego aside, which is in, can be incredibly difficult to get things done. And that book also teaches, teaches you how to work with the staff. Again, I cannot have expanded the mastering palace. I cannot have grown uh, myself as a mastering engineer, as a business owner, uh, if I had not read that book which, I read, which I'm angry that that book was not taught in college. There should be a whole class. And I'm sure in certain colleges there is. It is. It should be an entire course. It was not at my school. And I only found out about this book because of other publications outside of the music industry that I was reading, where that book had been at the top of a reading list of these you know, very important uh, CEOs. They always, this book was mentioned three times. I read it three times. Three different people had mentioned this book. I was like, I need to read this book. And I did. And I wish I had, I had read it 15 years sooner. So my best advice, uh, the best thing I could finish you with is read that book. That would be part of your hustle. That would be part of your management. That would be part of how you work with clients. It will be part of how you deal with your staff, how you work with your staff. It is super important. And it's a great book. And it was written 60, more than 60 years ago. Uh, much more than 60 years ago. And every lesson in it is um, just as relevant today as it was then. Uh, that's what's so good about it. And any other questions before we sign off? Frank, if you don't get a great vibe from a collaborator, what's your mindset on that? How would you navigate that? Um, for me, luckily, my collaboration is not the same as it is for a songwriter. Uh, if you're in the same room as a songwriter, you have to have a good vibe. If you don't, it's not gonna work. Um, for me, my collaborators are commonly either the mixing engineers or producers, and it's a communication via email. So it's, it, it's a different mindset and it's a different um, level of communication. I always focus on the song. First and, foremost, first and foremost, regardless of the people involved, regardless of whether I like them or not, regardless of whether we have a vibe or not, um, it's all about the song. Uh, the song is first and most important. And if I can just do that, then everything will be fine. Again, if you're in the same room writing a song with somebody, that's a whole different beast. And if it comes out with a great song, if, if you're a push and pull, your vibe creates a push and pull that creates a better song, that's awesome. If it doesn't, then it would be time to find a new collaborator. Uh, from Shelly, how important is it to live in New York or LA for career success? Uh, that's a question that happens all the time. Um, it's less important than it used to be 
but it is still important. Um, South Florida has become a new hub, especially if you're working in the Latin American market. Um, so the Miami, you know, the Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale down to Miami, there are great studios uh, that has become a new market. Nashville has always been a great market. You don't have to be in those areas, but you do need to be in areas where there are other people um, of your same mindset, whether if you're a songwriter. If you're a songwriter, you can be anywhere if you're around song other songwriters. If you are brand new, it is definitely helpful to be in New York, LA, Nashville, uh, Miami. Um, it, it, it just is. There's more people doing what you are doing that you want to do where you're gonna find that tribe. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it is very important. I want to say it's not entirely important. I really want to say that uh, great things can happen in, in other places, but finding your tribe is going to be a little bit more di difficult if you're in more rural places. So yeah, even Vegas, um, there's still a huge, there's a creative community in Vegas as well. Um, if, there are, if there are additional questions, we can remain on for another five minutes. Thank you, vocalist out. Uh, as far as any, uh, so Theo asks, any other books I would recommend? I'm trying to think. No, uh, that's a prime one. Other ones I would recommend are, so I just finished reading, um, oh yeah, for, 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 for techies. For technical people, the, any book on Bell Labs or Xerox or Skunk Works. I just finished reading a book on Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works. And a couple of years ago, I read the one on Bell Labs, which started off in Manhattan and then you know was housed in New Jersey. And from Bell Labs, Bell Labs created our entire world. They created the transistor. They're the ones that took us from these large, hot um, electricity consuming vacuum tubes to the transistor. And they created our, the entire world. The reason why we're doing what we are doing right now were created by the transistor and the for all of us. So there's a book from Bell Labs um, and I can't remember the name of it. Uh, I forget what that one was called. Uh, the Xerox one was called Dealers of Lightning. The people in Xerox Park, P-A-R-C, they created, you know, obviously the best printers, but then they also created, they were, were creating, uh, they created the ARPANET, which was our, you know, the first thing to the internet, and then the first interconnected office. The interesting thing about the Xerox Park story is that they failed sort of on the management side because corporate was too involved and restricted their play. So again, these three books, one of the things that you learn the most of is management skills. Um, Cause you know, here you are in the Skunk Works program of Lockheed Martin creating airplanes that never existed before. How do you do this? Well, you don't do it with a budget or a goal in mind. You have to let creatives, even if they're technical creatives, just go with no end goal in sight. Uh, would you do another webinar in the future explaining more of your thoughts on technical processes? possible. I prefer to do those in per person. Um, so yes, there will probably be one coming. There are some, I, I don't want to use this as a promo, but there are some coming out on one of the uh, platforms that have audio instruction or engineering instruction videos. I'll let you figure out which one it is. There's a couple coming out, one of which will have us cutting vinyl. Uh, also, we have a lathe, we cut vinyl, and it's still, it's 1940s, 50s technology, and it still fascinates me. So, yes, that's about it. I think we're, I think we've covered it all. Any last questions? We're good. Oh, from Roberto, how important the upward gear affect the prestige? I mean, the fully investing of the deployment. Apple gear is, everything is how you use it. Everything is how you use it, Roberto. Um, Apple gear is not necessary. It is far from it. There are times where, you know, I work both. And the majority of the reasons why I would work strictly in the box is because stuff comes so loud 
And so uh, there's a very, very narrow margin of gain that I have to work with. By the time I go through D to A converters and D to D converters, sound changes. Um, and it sound changes to a point where the, the mixing engineer or the artist doesn't like it. So it for that point, it stays in the box. And now there are so many more tricks you can do with plugins than you ever could do with analog gear. And the, anal and the plugins also sound, they've emulated sounds from some of my hardware gear uh, miraculously. So it's not super important. If, you, if you're tracking with microphones, very important. Uh, just get some good quality microphones and some good mic pre's. The mic pre's are more important than the, than the microphones. They're incredible uh, microphones at fair prices from Audio-Technica. They make great fair priced microphones. Good mic pre, good compressor, outboard compressor, and you're good to go. And that's it.